It's a fashion journey unlike any other, from red carpet glamour to royal bride. In many ways, a royal wedding dress is a bit of a mission statement. Basically, hello world, I'm a princess. Now Meghan faces a new challenge, dressing like a duchess. There's no handbook that you're given when you marry into the royal family. Without losing that mark or sparkle. People are surprised. Royal women do not tend to do off the shoulder. A lot of people acted like she'd showed up topless. She's learned that what a royal wears matters. Their clothes signal status, build bridges, and make careers. Someone like Meghan Markle wearing a hat really kind of puts you on the map. Our website nearly crashed. We sold all the stock of the dress within the space of a couple of hours. I wonder whether she knows how much impact she really has. She's changed our, our seamstresses' lives. And while royals don't often share what they are thinking, their clothes tell a different story. They may not say anything, but what they're wearing speaks a thousand words. As Meghan takes her place on the royal stage, she is making her voice heard loud and clear. She completely understands the power and the message that clothes convey. She's not being silenced. She's just figuring out ways to say what she wants to say without maybe using any words at all. Elizabeth and Philip wave their thanks to the happy cheers from below. The most important dress a royal woman will ever wear is her wedding gown. It is an iconic dress. It is a historic dress. That is the dress that defines their royal style. Even today, a lot of women look on their wedding day as their princess moment, particularly focused on this amazing dress. For a royal bride, the stakes are even higher. These women are having to transform themselves into princesses for real. This is the time in your life when the most amount of people will be looking at you. That's a lot of pressure. This is day one of being royal. You're marrying into this archetypal British institution and you're kind of setting out your stool, so to speak, of what kind of royal you're going to be. The wedding dress is the first way of them saying, this is how I see myself and this is where I see myself going. In many ways, a royal wedding dress is a bit of a mission statement. Meghan Markle married her prince at Windsor Castle in May 2018. The American actress turned to Givenchy designer Claire Waite Keller to make a gown that reflected her Hollywood past and her royal future. It was a very simple gown. Boat neck, long sleeves, very little ornamentation on the front at all. She's 36 years old of trying to walk the line between chic, elegant, bride, but like not foofy princess. The dress itself was very Meghan, very simple, very chic allowed her beauty to shine through. She was saying, this is a modern dress for a modern girl going into probably the biggest job of my life. Meghan's dress was so simple, it had just six seams, but her veil was hand embroidered with flowers representing the 53 nations of the Commonwealth, an association of independent sovereign states headed by the Queen. What most people don't realize is that the Queen had the flowers of the Commonwealth embroidered on her coronation gown. Meghan was paying tribute to Her Majesty the Queen by having those flowers embroidered on her veil. The flowers also symbolized the new Duke and Duchess of Sussex's plan to be the more international Commonwealth-focused royals. When Kate Middleton married Prince William in 2011, she too needed a dress that reflected her new position. She's marrying an heir to the British throne. She's getting married in Westminster Abbey in front of almost a thousand people. Her wedding dress was a big deal. Kate chose British designer Sarah Burton of Alexander McQueen to help her go from commoner to future queen. The dress itself was just so perfect. There was the lace, it was elegant with its sleeves, it was that beautiful sweetheart neckline that the Duchess wears so well. She really did look like a fairy tale princess. In Kate's dress, there was a huge attention to detail. She had her on every aspect of it. I mean, very beautiful, very flattering. This is not a woman who took her eye off the ball. This wasn't the case when 20-year-old Lady Diana Spencer married the Prince of Wales in 1981. Designers David and Elizabeth Emmanuel hadn't anticipated how much her dramatic ivory taffeta gown with its 25-foot train would crumple in the glass carriage. It kind of is, I think, the quintessential princess dress with huge puff sleeves and, like, this enormous skirt, enormous, it doesn't even fit in the carriage. 
she got out of the carriage and I remember thinking, oh, unmade bed, because that's what it looked like. Princess Diana arrived at St Paul's. We turned to the side and were horrified to see the dress was completely and utterly creased. I think it is telling of Diana's gown that I thought it was the most amazing dress I'd ever seen in my entire life because I was five. I mean, it was the dreamiest thing that uh, you've ever seen as a little kid. I mean, she was marrying the Prince of Wales. Like, you want big, you got it. It was a fairy tale gown, but an unhappy marriage. The prince and princess separated just over a decade later. She seemed a little lost inside it as she later became lost in the marriage. It, it was a romantic confection that couldn't quite... The Queen and Prince Philip's marriage, on the other hand, has lasted more than seven decades. Their 1947 wedding was just two years after World War II ended and clothing was still rationed in Britain. This was the drabbest time of our history after World War II where we'd had sort of blackouts and no money and nothing wonderful. A lot of people sent their clothing ration to the Queen. She had to send it all back because it was actually illegal for her to take other people's rations. But she was allowed an extra 200 by, by the government. So she wore this deep ivory silk dress and Norman Hartnell put millions of seed pearls and lovely crystals all over it. And there were lovely flowers embroidered all over it, jasmine and lilac and white roses. It was a beautiful young girl's wedding dress, but had all the pageantry of a future queen. And it lifted the whole spirits of the nation. The Princess Elizabeth of England had become a bride in what was certainly the wedding of the century. I think she had to try to really hit that balance of, you know, the regal tradition, but not wanting to look so crazy excessive that it was insensitive. That very much reflects how she does her job today. So I think it's interesting that you can sort of see the roots of the kind of queen she's become in the way that she handled her wedding dress. Her Majesty's wedding outfit was perfect, but it had almost been a disaster. Just two hours before the ceremony, her diamond Russian fringe tiara snapped in half. It was rushed under armed guard uh, to the Crown Jewelers' garage workshops where it was repaired in time for her to wear on the day. At any royal wedding, all eyes are on the bride's choice of tiara. That unveiling of the tiara on her wedding day marks the crowning of love and the passage from one household to another. Princess Diana wore her own Spencer family tiara. Lady Diana was demonstrating that her family was of enough importance that it had its own tiara. Um, and uh, she was a lady standing in her own right already. Royal brides without a family tiara don't need to worry. They can wear one from the Queen's extensive jewellery collection. When they walk down the aisle with a historic heirloom royal piece on their head, it's basically, hello world, I'm a princess. Kate Middleton was loaned the Queen's Cartier Halo tiara. It had belonged to the Queen Mother as well as having been worn by the Queen. It's giving a message that she is becoming part of this family. Meghan Markle chose an Art Deco style diamond and platinum bandeau tiara. It was originally made for Queen Mary, the Queen's grandmother. The Queen loaning Meghan a tiara that had quite a long royal lineage. I do think it was a way for the royal diamondy stamp of approval. Um, I think it was definitely a statement. The uh, best kind of stamp yes. of approval. <laughs> uh, a statement that she was fully part of them. Rumor has it there was some tiara drama when it came to picking out the headpiece. A story did come out that apparently Meghan wanted a certain tiara. The Queen said no. The story at the time was that Meghan threw a strop and tiara tantrums. As I understand it, that didn't happen. I mean, for goodness sake, the Queen, your future grandmother-in-law, is lending you this amazing piece of jewellery. You're going to take what's given. You're not going to start making demands. So as I understand it, it was Harry who got upset. The extra twist to that story is that it's rumoured that Eugenie got the tiara that Meghan had wanted. But I do think if you're a little girl growing up in the royal family and you know all this stuff is in there, you're going to have the one that you had your heart set on. Creating the perfect wedding day look isn't easy, but it's only the first in a long line of royal fashion challenges. A new princess needs a working wardrobe that reflects her royal position, but also stays true to her individual sense of style. Any woman marrying into the royal family and becoming a royal has to take a long, hard look at how they dress and what their style is suddenly the whole world is watching. Unlike most royal brides, Meghan was camera ready 
before she joined the family. Meghan was a celebrity quite high profile already and so was already doing red carpet type events before she met Harry. So she wasn't catapulted from ordinary girl next door to princess. She was already out there. She came in as an adult woman in her mid-30s with her own established style. And it was a style that took on a certain public remit as well, given that she was a television star. She liked simple shapes, she liked trousers, she often showed some flesh, didn't wear hose. A lot of that has obviously had to go. To help create a more demure royal look, Meghan has called on a string of high-end designers. Meghan's approach to royal dressing is very Hollywood. She isn't afraid of throwing money at the situation. When Meghan's sister-in-law, Kate, first married, she took the opposite approach to royal dressing. Wearing so much mass-market fashion, she was nicknamed Queen of the High Street. When she first became the Duchess of Cambridge. She was wearing a lot of High Street, Topshop, Zara, H&M. And consciously or not, it was her way of saying, I'm just a normal girl, I'm just like you, I happen to be in this crazy position that fallen in love with the future King of England, and whoa, look at me. That approachability and kind of normalcy, I think, made her inspire to you, but actually acquire. And I think she was extremely calculated about being like, I'm not going to look like I showed up and was just like, great, I'm going to open up the bank account and throw money around and roll around in it. Unlike Kate and Meghan, when Princess Diana became engaged, she was just a teenager without a strong sense of style. When Lady Diana first came into our shop, she was this very shy 19-year-old girl who wasn't used to having clothes made for her. So here was her wonderful opportunity to be able to choose a complete wardrobe for herself at long last. And so she was like a child in a sweet shop. She didn't quite know which one she'd like to try. At the early stages, she didn't know what to do. I mean, her first outing with Prince Charles, she's just got engaged, and she wears a black dress with a rather neckline and of course she's wrong-footed and she feels embarrassed new royals have to get used to walking the line between being stylish and looking appropriate so what are the rules of royal dressing you hear a lot of talk about royal protocol when it comes to dressing and, and there isn't a book of fashion royal rules but there there is an etiquette royals tend not to wear black unless they're in mourning royal women tend to wear hosiery they are encouraged to wear tights and shouldn't be too high um, and in the presence of the Queen they're expected to wear hats. I think the thing about royalty is they make up rules as they go along. There's no book that says this is what you've got to wear. The standard for royal dressing has been set by the Queen who's had more than 65 years on the throne to hone her instantly recognizable look. The Queen herself really does have a uniform. It is generally a bright coat, a hat. A, or, usually of a particular shape too, yes. right? like she would like to wear like sort of um cake shaped hats yeah. like a cake on her head um that's a the, compliment by the yes, way yes <laughs> i think the queen is perfect um and then she wears the same low heel black pumps and the same square shaped purse that she's worn for 50 years mm -hmm. so she's very smart about wearing bright colors everywhere so that even if you're in the nosebleeds and you're on your tiptoes craning your neck to see her you're gonna see that hit of lime green and be like i saw the queen kate is full in Her Majesty's footsteps as future Queen Consort. And she seems to be taking fashion cues from the monarch as well. When you watch Kate and the choices that she makes, it's very much block colour, it's beautifully tailored coat dresses. I think absolutely she's looked to Queen Elizabeth for fashion inspiration. And why not? Because the Queen really has mastered that art of royal dressing over the years. A royal woman should always dress for the occasion. Whether she's planting a tree, attending a gala, or visiting hospital. Princess Diana was really good and thoughtful about dressing for duty. She had a hospital, particularly to see children. She would wear really bright and cheerful clothing. And she often refused to wear gloves because she wanted to make sure there was like skin to skin that people felt her. She touched their hands, they touched hers. She wanted to touch people. She wanted to hug people. And she changed the way we look at royals. Princess Diana changed the formality of royal dressing. She broke all rules, but she did it in the right way. 
Like Princess Diana, Meghan is breaking the rules and putting her own twist on royal dressing. The Duchess of Sussex has, I think, chosen to dress quite differently for a royal. And certainly she's not a huge fan of block colour. She loves neutral palettes, you know, the greys, the whites, the creams. When Meghan showed up for her first Tribune the Colour, she wore a Carolina Herrera gown that was, it wasn't really off the shoulder. It was like a, a sort of a modified boat neck. Yeah, it was like a, a wide bateau. Um, it was not out of the realm of normalcy, uh, although a lot of people acted like she'd showed up topless. People were very surprised. Royal women do not tend to do off the shoulder. It suited her beautifully, but there were some raised eyebrows. One of the defining moments for Meghan um, when she was sort of establishing herself in the royal beat was an early engagement where she turned up for an awards ceremony in a black Alexander McQueen tux. And I think she was sending out a very clear message. Yes, I'm a member of the royal family, but don't expect me to give up my love of fashion. And she looked fantastic. And even when heavily pregnant, she's kept her four-inch stiletto heels. Personally, I think it's a good thing that she's pushing at these boundaries a little bit. They can feel anachronistic. There was a moment also early on after her marriage when Meghan wore flesh-coloured tights. And a lot of us threw up our hands and said, what are you doing? You her already. I think in those early months after the royal wedding, she dressed how she thought she ought to dress. And I think we've seen her become a bit more playful, a bit more experimental, and a little more confident in her fashion choices. Meghan's more daring royal fashion seems to be having an effect on her sister-in-law's style. As Kate moves further from her middle-class upbringing, she's leaving the high street behind her and wearing more high-end fashion brands like Erdem, Amelia Wickstead, and her dress designer Alexander McQueen. She is finding her feet in fashion. She's finding more of a personal style. And I think we're all beginning to enjoy that. She has gone from high street duchess to designer duchess. Princess Diana is remembered as the ultimate royal fashionista, but it took years to develop her iconic look. It was very much trial and error in her early days. She had a tendency to like very pretty, very romantic, very frou-frou clothes. This dress was a typical fairy princess dress. It's a lovely off-the-shoulder neckline. Blue satin sash at the waist. Big crinoline skirt. She wore this in 1981. As the princess grew more confident in her role, her style became more sophisticated. This glamorous black dress was made for her in 1991. So there's a big difference of how Diana's changed from a pretty romantic dress to a very sophisticated grown-up woman's dress. As she started traveling around a little bit more she started seeing how perhaps she would like to look. That's where I came in to help her get rid of all the frills and the flounces and become more of an international dresser. Jacques Azaguri was one of the designers Diana turned to to evolve her image. For me, she was perfect woman to dress. She was five foot ten, you know, a, a great size, great legs. She knew straight away what she wanted to wear. Over the years that I was dressing Diana, of course her style just changed completely. And I was seeing her developing into this really stylish, glamorous woman, which is so far from where she started. Diana was far from the first royal woman to become a fashion icon. The Queen's younger sister, Princess Margaret, loved French couture and made headlines for her elegant look. Princess Margaret made people excited about fashion, about monarchy, about how daring she could be, about what she could pull off next. She was glamorous, I mean, really glamorous. I remember on an occasion going to fix some dresses on her at Kensington Palace. Princess Margaret was in a burgundy velvet Yves Saint Laurent suit with a polythene over her head, draped down over the suit, and she was whitewashing the conservatory wall. The more fashion risks a royal takes, the more likely it is something will go wrong. These women do make mistakes at times. Kate famously had her skirt blow up in a Marilyn Monroe moment, and now apparently weights her skirts with curtain weights. Meghan, of course, had her moment where she arrived in Tonga with the label on her self-portrait dress still showing. 
These are rare mistakes from two style icons, but an earlier duchess, Sarah Ferguson, had a much harder time figuring out royal dressing. Fergie, to me, is very lovable. Mm -hmm. She sort of, to me, always reminded me of like that one friend you have who shows up and is always kind of like, oh my god, you are on this, what is going on? Yeah. You might not have always liked Sarah's choices, but I think they were very reflective of her character. A little bit garish, a little bit loud, rather fun and, and not always getting it right. I'll see you later. <laughs> Fergie's daughters, Princesses Beatrice and Eugenie, famously got it wrong at William and Kate's wedding. The hats, which are meant to be the finishing touch, you know, that, that final hint of elegance to the outfit, well, in Beatrice's case, were just disastrous. I mean, it was likened to everything from an octopus to a pretzel to a loo seat. I mean, she stood out for all of the wrong reasons. I love those hats. You know, hats off to them for really pushing out the boat. And they were incredibly constructed. I mean, that is Philip Tracy at his best. The, the impact that those hats had around the world, I mean, was amazing. Choosing the right hat is a fashion challenge that all royal women have to face. Why do royal women wear hats? I bet Meghan Markle must have been asking herself that continuously last year. Up until about the 1950s, it was traditional for women in Britain to cover their hair. Royal women have hung on to this tradition for a bit longer, partly because they have more formal events than the rest of us. Also, it does serve as a kind of, you know, exclamation point on the head to draw the public's attention to them. In a crowd, they're the person you see. Hats are really synonymous with royal women, and I think when you have married in, it must be a bit of a sartorial minefield. I would always say to anyone that's trying hats on for the first time, it, just really try on lots and lots of hats. Um, and I would imagine this was a similar situation for Meghan. You really have to find out what suits your face and suits your body. Meghan selected one of her one Golding's creations for her second royal Christmas at Sandringham. Seeing the Duchess of Sussex wearing my hat on TV at Christmas was amazing. It was the best experience, um, especially because I shared it with my family, who were all there at Christmas too, obviously, so we were all very excited. Hong Kong raised a one, made her first hat when she was invited to an English wedding. It inspired her to train as a milliner and set up a business in London. I would say my customer is a modern woman. So she enjoys fashion, she understands her own style and has a confidence as well. I make my hats by hand. So because it's handcrafted, it's quite labor intensive and time consuming. In terms of business, someone like Meghan Markle, the Duchess of Sussex, wearing a hat really kind of puts you on the map. I've definitely seen an uptick in interest. The only royal who exceeds Meghan's ability to bring attention and sales to the designers she wears is her sister-in-law. Meghan and Kate are massive for the fashion industry. You know, whatever they wear, it sells out. The Kate effect, well, it's phenomenal. It's possibly the best marketing and advertising vehicle that any brand could ever wish for. I think Kate's approachable, it's uh, feminine, uh, it's got lots of things that make people want to buy the same thing and wear it, and then they feel like, oh, I can have my little piece of the fairy tale. Cecile Renault's maternity brand, Seraphine, experienced the Kate effect when the Duchess wore one of their dresses for a photograph with her new baby son, Prince George. So the first time I saw Kate wearing one of our dresses in public was uh, an amazing moment. Our website nearly crashed. We sold all the stock of the dress within the space of a couple of hours. You know, this is five years ago and that dress today remains one of our best-selling models. Seraphine's stylish maternity clothes have become one of Kate's go-to pregnancy options. For a brand to be worn by Kate, it's amazing endorsement uh, and, you know, it's um, really a springboard for the brand to get known internationally. Obviously, it immediately gets a lot of media attention and gets seen in newspapers, in uh, the media. This royal blue dress is really famous as uh, Kate wore it during her third pregnancy, during the first official engagement with Meghan. So, obviously, it made a lot of headlines. You know, they were called the Fabulous Four. That dress absolutely experienced the Kate effect. It's definitely now one of our new iconic styles. Every collection, we create a capsule, which we call the Kate um, you know, collection. And we really think about her style, if it would suit her. She's a little bit of a muse for our uh, fashion brand. It's not just Kate and Meghan who support British fashion. Camilla, the Duchess of Cornwall, attended London Fashion Week in February 2019, and the Queen herself was the previous year. 
but it's the younger royals whose every outfit change is followed by fans across the globe. There are people in the world who sort of follow Kate and Meghan and their wardrobe the way other people follow sports teams. There's all these bloggers who identify what the women wear and how you too can wear it, either designer version or on a budget, because who doesn't want to look like Meghan or Kate because they're both amazingly good looking and stylish women. Across social media, the hashtags mirror Meg and replicate are used by women around the world to display their Duchess inspired outfits. Hi, I'm Mallory from Washington, and I'm wearing a dress that Kate Middleton wore during her royal tour to India. Hi, this is Linda from Mexico. Hello, I'm Janelle from Arizona. Hi, I'm Brigitte from Winnipeg, Manitoba. Hi, my name is Jennifer. I'm from Brisbane, Australia, and today I'm wearing an L.K. Bennett dress which Kate wore on her royal tour here in 2014. Kate's passion for the high street has made it easy for her followers to get their hands on her style, whatever their budget. I'm also wearing a Hobbs Gianna coat, which was worn at a Place to Be event in 2018. Underneath it is a summer set by Temperley Boat Dress. I'm wearing a Temperley Odell coat, Todd's Balletto Bag and Gray, and Jimmy Choo Cosmic Heels. At consignment stores or using websites. So I got the jacket for $50, I got the skirt for $40, and I got these Michael Kors metallic navy shoes for $25. The total outfit cost itself is just over $1,000, and unfortunately for my husband, I spent way too much money uh, on emulating her fashions. Royal fans might be dropping a lot of cash on their look, but it's nothing compared to the cost of Kate and Meghan's designer outfits. Meghan Markle is reported to have spent quite a lot of money on her look in the year after her engagement. Reports have put it actually at perhaps a million pounds. We do want our royal women to look different. We want them to look amazing. We want them to wear designer dresses. We want them to be obtainable, but also unobtainable. On a 2017 trip to Paris, Kate wore a $4,000 Jenny Packham dress and a Chanel coat costing $10,000. And in March 2019, Meghan attended an evening reception in Morocco wearing a bespoke Dior kaftan gown reported to be worth over $100,000. How much a royal wardrobe is worth, what you or I might pay for it, is very different to how much a royal wardrobe actually cost. The palaces are very clear and they say that all royals pay for their clothes. But what they will never tell us is, do they get them at cost price? What kind of discount do they get? Are the clothes just borrowed? I do think there should be more clear about how that relationship works because frankly, we really don't know. Meghan and Kate's work wardrobes are paid for by Prince Charles from the income he receives from his royal estates. It was very in the last royal accounts, there was a clear spike in Prince Charles's expenditure for the Sussexes and the Cambridges, and a lot of people put that down to the huge hike that he was having to pay for both of the Duchess's designer dresses. The Prince of Wales, I'm sure, would argue that it is a very worthwhile investment. We expect our royals to dress beautifully. They are there as ambassadors for the Queen, but for Great Britain, particularly when they're overseas. So we expect them to look the part, and that doesn't come cheap. A foreign tour puts a princess wardrobe under an even brighter spotlight. Meghan's first taste of this came in October 2018, when she and Harry spent 16 days visiting Australia, New Zealand, Fiji and Tonga. Royal tours, big deal, huge amount of preparation. There's a sort of tour bible which will list all the etiquette, the venues, the people they're going to meet, you know, the colours that might be offensive to a certain nation, ways to pay respect. Because the royals don't say very much, what they wear is hugely important. Um, they will often honour the host country um, or nation by wearing a certain colour. More often than not, when Kate and William were in Canada, Kate wore a maple leaf brooch that the Queen had previously worn, Camilla had previously worn, and I believe the Queen Mother had also previously worn. So it was quite a long provenance with Canada. And that's kind of a good way for them, through their clothing, to reinforce Hey, we have a long relationship here. We've been friends forever. Mm -hmm. The Queen puts a lot of thought into her clothes. On her first trip to Ireland, and the UK and Ireland have had a very difficult history, she got out of the plane and she was wearing their national colour, green. And it says, I come in friendship. And immediately you felt everybody's shoulders sort of went down and thought, this is going to work, and it really did. Meg's carefully planned tour wardrobe 
included this dress by Australian designer Martin Grant, a necklace of New Zealand jade, and a stunning evening gown in Fijian blue. They call it soft diplomacy. It's this idea that you've studied up and you've learned and you're trying to pay homage to your hosts in a way that is subtle but meaningful um, and which could obviously benefit the country. One of the Australian brands that Meghan wore several times on the tour was ethical jeans company Outland Denim. It was a pretty surreal experience, if I'm honest with you. I just landed with um, some of my colleagues in Cambodia the night before and woke up to look at our phone screens and they were full of messages. We couldn't really work out what the kerfuffle was, why it was such a big deal, but then we discovered that, um, yeah, Megan had hopped off a plane wearing our black Harriet jean, which then, within 24 hours, sold out. Megan wasn't just supporting a local designer, she had chosen a company that shared her passion for improving other women's lives. We employ uh, women in Cambodia from a range of different backgrounds. Um, women that have been trafficked and sold for sex or labour have severe disabilities, just vulnerable women. We exist to be able to help them and give them new opportunities and we created a business model that would be designed to be able to put the power back in their own hands to make the change themselves. Yeah, the impact of the exposure Megan has been able to give us is huge. Um, it means that uh, we're able to move into new territories that we wouldn't have moved into um, so soon. It's meant that our business has grown rapidly. I mean, in 48 hours, we saw 1,000% increase um, in web traffic uh, in Australia. That then flowed out into other regions. And we were selling jeans with a six month wait. I wonder whether she knows how much impact she really has. She's changed our, our seamstresses' lives. But when you talk about restoring dignity in somebody's life who's come from the most horrible things, to go from that to becoming an expert in denim and then making denim for a princess, I mean, that's unbelievable. That's the story that our seamstresses have. Megan's interest in supporting women through fashion continued back in Britain with the announcement she would become the royal patron of Smartworks. They get career coaching to help them ace the interview and then also they get a restyle with very high-end clothes that have been donated. And for me, this first patronage Smartworks was absolutely ingenious. It harnessed Megan's passion for fashion with a real kind of social outreach work. When the Duchess went to visit the charity, she actually styled one of the women who was there, who was going for a interview. I think this is I a good one, really good. right? And it's a good size for her yeah. too. I was there when she did her first public visit to Smartwork and she bossed the joint. She's very, very good at selecting clothes and she completely understands the power and the message that clothes convey. You know, people made so much out of the fact that when Meghan was marrying into the royal family, she might lose her voice as an independent woman and as a feminist because she might be restricted about what and how she can speak out. And I think these kinds of situations yeah. are an example of the ways that she's finding a way, you know, in addition to being able to give some speeches, she is supporting clothing brands that support women. And she is supporting charities that find ways to support women. Like she's not being silenced. She's just figuring out ways to say what she wants to say without maybe using any words at all. Royal women throughout history have used their clothes as their voice. And even today, when we have a duchess like Meghan, who has told us that we will be hearing her voice, the clothes do a lot of the talking for them. Even the queen can't escape scrutiny over her outfits. The year after Britain voted to leave the European Union, Her Majesty opened Parliament wearing a blue and yellow hat. People wondered if she was sending a message about the Brexit referendum. Everybody said, is she wearing a Brexit hat? Is that the flag of Europe, blue and yellow? Could have been, could not have been, who knows? A lot of people were like, no, it's a coincidence. It's not a coincidence. She does not do anything by accident. No. Of course it looked like that intentionally. I think she absolutely did that on purpose. Mm -hmm. And I think when you are in a place where you're not supposed to use your voice, what else can you use? Use your hat. <laughs> when it comes to using clothes to send a message, there's one royal woman who had it down to an art. Princess Diana famously was a communicator via fashion. She used her clothes to reflect herself emotionally. One of Princess Diana's most notorious incidents of meaningful dressing was the revenge dress. So good. The night that Prince Charles was on TV uh, admitting to adultery with Camilla Parker Bowles, Diana showed up at the Serpentine Gala in a knockout frock. She looked like three million bucks. She wore that dress with a deliberate message, quite simply to say to Charles, look what you're missing. Apparently Diana that night had another dress picked out and it's so easy to imagine her eye falling on that dress and her having a screw you moment as she thinks, I've spent my adult life being top sassy dress 
Out comes hot Diana, and she relaunches herself upon the world. In 1996, Diana and Charles officially divorced. Diana was still a princess, but no longer known as Her Royal Highness. I think when she lost that title, she found a new inner confidence. It was like a weight had been taken off her shoulders. She became more daring. Her outfits became sexier. I think there was a bit of Diana that just didn't care. I remember her going to Venice, um, and she gets out of the gondola, and she's wearing this glamorous, red, quite short, slip of a dress. It was a very daring, sexy dress in the way that it had a zip all the way up the front. And she was actually going to wear it almost to just below the bus so that we could say a little bit of midriff. And we absolutely said, no, you can't do that. One of the last things she did before she went on that last trip to France, she went to Swan. At the time that I made the blue dress for the princess for the Swan Lake Gala, she was probably at the peak of her being. You know, she was slightly tanned. She was really, really fit. So we decided to have a really minimalist dress, which it was. It had quite a low decolletage, and it was very short in the length, probably the shortest dress she, she will have worn. She looked extraordinary. She looked young, she looked glowing, and frankly, she looked sexy. And she wanted it to be known she was free. She was a woman on her own, and she was the most famous woman in the world. Princess Diana's fashion legacy lives on through her jewellery, which has been passed down to her son's wives, Kate and Meghan. Most famously, Prince William gave Kate his mother's sapphire and diamond engagement ring. It cannot be understated the emotions that the boys feel. Obviously, to the mother, they feel they lost much too young. It's deeply significant to see these pieces coming out in public again. When the Duchess of Sussex landed in Sydney, the Duchess was wearing a pair of earrings that had belonged to Princess Diana that she had also worn in Australia. It's interesting when we see them wearing Diana's jewels. It puts them within a lineage, within a history, within a family, within a culture, and it shows that they're royalty. For big occasions, the Duchess has also borrowed jewellery from the Queen's collection. At a 2018 state banquet for the Dutch royal family, Kate was loaned some major league bling. Everything, really, that she wore was kind of shouting lineage from the rooftops, really. You had the Lover's Knot tiara, which, of course, famously, her mother-in-law, Princess Diana, was one of her favourite tiaras, and it has become one of Kate's as well. She was wearing a necklace that Queen Alexandra and the Queen Mother had previously worn, so a very important, iconic piece of jewellery that had been handed down. She queen can give to a family member. I've never seen her looking so future queen-like. Of course, for the Queen herself, wearing priceless jewellery has become second nature. Apparently, Princess Margaret used to say that the Queen was the only person who could put on a tiara as she was walking downstairs. I think most people have to have her hairdresser involved and have the whole thing set, but I think the Queen is so used to it that literally she can multitask and as she's running out the door, she'll put her tiara on. Thank you. The Queen's jewellery collection you just couldn't fathom. It's huge, opulent, um, magnificent. It does feel like an Aladdin's and I don't know if for security reasons we will ever understand the limit of it. The royals put on the big gems to honour important guests, but they're also a way to signal their wealth and status. I do think jewels are one of the best ways that the royal family sets out a continuity mm -hmm. of appearance. It's a way for them to remind the world we're in this family, this yeah. very important family. Throughout history, royals have had to look different to us. Otherwise, why are they ruling us? These are incredibly beautiful creations. But it is also about money, about prestige, about status, about being different to us. And that difference is why we remain fascinated by royal fashion. The French have haute couture. The Americans have the glamour of Hollywood. And we have the glamour and pomp of royal dressing. Royal fashion, the clothes that they wear, are a very, very important way of them communicating a message to the public. It is their way of identifying with a nation, with its people, of sending out a message of solidarity and support. They may not say anything, but what they're wearing speaks a thousand words. What the royals choose to wear tells us who they are. The Queen is telling us she's dependable via her clothes. We are safe in her reign, and it's a rather wonderful thing. Kate is clearly dressing as a future queen. She knows her role. 
She knows what is expected of her and she dresses for the occasion. So it is Meghan Markle who has the opportunity to push the boundaries and create her own royal style. Meghan's telling us that she's early in her career as a royal, that she brought a career with her and she's trying to mesh the two. She may be a duchess, but she is still her own woman. She has been trying to hang on to her former self. And it'll be interesting to see in the future if that continues or if she evolves. And that's an even...